Hello, and welcome to um, a sermon of sorts uh, to um, look at the readings from yesterday and to also reflect on um, a psalm that uh, the bishop addressed a few days ago. So let us pray and put ourselves uh, in a mindset for listening to God's word. Heavenly Father, by your grace and mercy, you call us uh, to worship you and to give you thanks and praise and glory. But at the same time, you call us to think and reflect on your word so that our lives may be impacted so that we may go forth and show your kingdom to all those around us. May we listen to these words of scripture and mark them deeply. And we ask this in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. I think that I've waited um, a little bit longer than normal uh, to address the issues around COVID-19. As I said in my previous video, because I'm a little reticent, to give any type of advice uh, simply because the advice is out there. We are very aware through the media, whatever um, circles you, you find yourself reading and, and digesting, there's a lot of information. So I don't want to clutter that information by offering something that isn't useful or just states the same stuff that everyone else is saying. So I am not an expert. I'm not going to act like a pundit. Um, I am simply going to tell everyone um, that I am a priest, that my main role is um, to proclaim the gospel, and to do so um, as I've often said in my sermons, holding, as Bart uh, uh, said, uh, the great uh, theologian, uh, with a newspaper in one hand and the Bible in the other. I want to be able to focus on Scripture to be our guide, to inform us of how we are doing things and how we should go about uh, conducting ourselves in this new world that we have currently. My first reflection comes from Psalm 137, and the bishop addressed this uh, a few days ago in a video that he presented, and I, I, I encourage you uh, to go to the diocesan website on the COVID-19 and the videos and to look at, I believe it was the video on Saturday um, that, the bishop, um, that the bishop uploaded. So I want us to look at Psalm 137, and here it is. So the bishop reflected on, by the waters of Babylon, we sat down and wept when we remembered Zion. If you're familiar with my sermons, you know that this is a very important text for me and uh, a launching off spot for a lot of discussions that involve exile. I began Lent using this particular uh, text on Ash Wednesday uh, and spoke, and on the first Sunday of Lent, speaking to that feeling that we have when we're in exile. And at the moment, all of us are on an imposed exile in order to protect others and to protect ourselves. But the verse goes on. On the willows there we hung our harps, for there our captives ask us for songs, and our tormentors ask for mirth, saying, Sing us one of the songs of Zion. So the image is clear. The captors are saying to the people in exile, Hey, give us a happy song. Give us a joyful song. And then the next line hit hard for me on Saturday night. 
How could we sing the Lord's song in a foreign land? How could we sing the Lord's song in a foreign land? As I watch the videos on Sunday and I reflected on what is usually quite a glorious day in, in, in Lent. It's the middle of Lent, uh, Latere Sunday. Uh, we wear rose-colored vestments, those of us who are of the Ang Anglo-Catholic persuasion within the church. We have a lighter heart. There's a simnel cake. It's Mother's Day in England, and it's Mothering Sunday, a great day of joy. But how can we have that joy in the midst of that crisis, this crisis? How can we sing the Lord's song in a foreign land? At the moment, we are very much in a foreign land, and we're trying very much to try to create normality. And I guess my argument is that it's not normal. We're not in a normal situation. Watching people, ch clergy, celebrate in church, there was a certain level of comfort, the familiarity, but then at the same time, it was jarring because I wasn't in church. It wasn't a normal Sunday. There was no weather outside. It was a beautiful day. And I was reminded of this passage again and again as I reflected. How can we sing the Lord's song in a foreign land? And I couldn't for the life of me understand why the videos of church services on Sunday were done in church. Now, I know that there's counter arguments and I know that people will say, well, because it does give us the familiarity, because we feel that we're connected with church. But I don't see that. Not for myself. I see that we are in the midst of a crisis. And that I, as a priest and, and pastor of this parish, need to join along with you, mostly parishioners, I would assume, who are home and bound and not able. We are not permitted to gather for worship. So me, say, having a service over at um, Trinity and inviting, say, Sharon and a select few to come to the service, to me just seems odd. And so these videos that I'm going to do are not going to be from church. And on Easter Sunday, as I predict, where we won't be in church, I will continue to pray here in my den, as you are probably praying in your den or on your phone at home. And in that solidarity, we can sing the Lord's song, but together in our new place, in front of our computers, where we don't often, I would venture to say, worship and pray and praise and intercede for others. It's not normal to do that um, through this medium. And I don't know if we're setting an appropriate example for the future um, by making this convenience normalized. There's nothing normal about this time. I want us to turn to our scripture readings for Sunday so that we understand a different perspective. And it ties along with what I've just said. So here you can find on lectionary.anglican.ca uh, the lectionary readings for Sunday and for the day. So if you want to pray daily, this is the site to go to. 
So here we have the fourth Sunday of Lent, and we will see that the readings are completely provided. So, our first reading, the one that I want to focus on. The Lord said to Samuel, How long will you grieve over Saul? I have rejected him from being king over Israel. Fill your horn with oil and set out. I will send you to Jesse, the Bethlehemite, for I have provided for myself a king amongst his sons. Samuel said, How can I go? If Saul hears of it, he will kill me. And the Lord said, Take a heifer with you and say, I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. Invite Jesse to the sacrifice, and I will show you what you shall do. And you shall anoint the one for me, the one whom I name to you. So Samuel did as the Lord commanded. So the, the setting is that there's a fear of Saul. Uh, Saul has um, become very wayward and uh, bound on earthly things. Samuel, as Samuel is wont to do, focuses on heavenly things and on the direction from the Lord. Saul, in many ways, is kind of like a, a bit of an opportunist and always comes across in scripture in that way, at least in my reading. And I, I see this fear that Samuel has, but the Lord is saying, trust me, you know, uh, bring a heifer, uh, we're going to have a sacrifice, and I'm going to show you exactly what you need to do, so don't worry. So the elders of the city came to meet him with trembling and said, do you come peaceably? And he said, yeah, peaceably. I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. Sanctify yourselves and come to me, uh, or come with me to the sacrifice. And he sanctified Jesse's and his, and his sons and invited them to the sacrifice. And then he came and looked on the eldest, Eliab, and thought, surely the Lord's anointed is now, uh, is now before the Lord. You see, Samuel thinks that things are going to be like normal. Samuel looks at this situation and says, well, there's the eldest son. Uh, well, I, need, I don't need to look at anybody else. This is the one who the Lord will anoint because he's the old, oldest. And that's not the case. Do not look on his appearance or on the height of his stature because I have rejected him. The Lord does not see as mortals see. And that really is the key text for today's reflection. Samuel wants an immediacy. He wants things to happen now. He wants to get them over with, partly because of the fear, right? There's, there's an element of fear. But he's thinking like we do as, as the reader. We're looking at this and saying, well, obviously, you know, Jesse's son is, is, is going to be the most, um, uh, uh, the one who meets the qualifications. And uh, Eliab seems to meet all those qualifications. And the Lord says, no, this is not the one. So Samuel it, it is shocked. Mm, oh, okay. So this is what happens next. Because the Lord does not look at the outward appearance. He looks right here. But the Lord looks on the heart. Jesse called Abinadab, made him pass before Samuel. Neither has the Lord chosen this one. Or Shama. No, nope, not him. I can feel in the passage Samuel's impatience. He says to Jesse, the Lord has not chosen any of these. And Jesse's probably quite anxious as well. There does remain the youngest, but he's keeping the sheep. So he's the youngest and, and he's a shepherd. Yes, he's beautiful and ruddy appearance and all that stuff, but, and he's handsome. 
he's in culture in a cultural sense he's the last person you'd expect to be chosen and of course david is is one of the the most important figures in judaism for ourselves at christmas time of course we're talking about the 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 root of jesse and the stem of jesse and we we speak about david and 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 um and his lineage drawing um that to Christ, Jesus of Nazareth, who goes to the city of Bethlehem, or whose mother goes to the city of Bethlehem to deliver him. But God thinks differently from us. David is the one who's chosen. He may not necessarily be the weakest, but he's the youngest. And he's not the one that people would just automatically go to by any means at all. See, the Lord looks at the world in a different way. He looks at situations in a very different way, and we cannot understand why this coronavirus has taken hold. We can look at the scientific um, methods and, 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 um, and the plans and the science, and of course, we understand that there is a lot of science behind this. But as Christians, we firmly believe that all things have been set in their course by the Lord. And that through sin, the world has, there's an element of dysfunction that needs redemption. And that's through Christ. That redemption it comes in a way that is surprising through Jesus, who meets with those who are unclean, who are um, ordinarily seen as evil in the sight of the Lord, adulterers, sinners, those who are unclean by health issues. You know, Jesus says, no, neither this man nor his parents sinned. He's blind so that God's glory may be seen. It's a different perspective than saying coronavirus is caused by God or created by God. No, it's part of our brokenness within this world. It's part of the free will that it's in, that's inherent in the world. So we can't say, well, God sent this down as a punishment. We have to really avoid that type of theological um, um, assessment that we impose on scripture. In this sense, what, what Jesus is saying through these readings or, or what the Lord is saying through these readings is, hey, neither, nobody sinned to cause this. It is part of the world in the way that it is. God is watching over us. And we should not be so quick to jump in and say, well, things have to be done this way right away. That's Samuel's um, attitude. Let's get this done. Uh, you know, there, there's a fear and, and, and all of this because of Saul. And he wants to get things done fast. And God is saying, no, not this one, not this one, not the most apparent. God is looking at the heart. As we move forward amid this COVID-19 crisis, because it is a crisis, we are in exile. And we move in a way that has to be much more slow and intentional. And as I've used the word countless time, and I will continue to do that, we reflect. None of us should be jumping the gun in our anxiety. None of us should be jumping the gun in our anxiety to kind of do anything quickly. I need to take a moment and pause. Could I have preached this sermon yesterday? No. It's very unlike me to not be able to just preach at, at the drop of a hat, to be honest. I love preaching the word of the Lord. But 
I knew that I needed to wait and really assess and reflect and turn to scripture as the guide to kind of inform me of how I'm going to proceed. Now, this will be very different from others. So others will say, no, we need to be in church. Um, um, uh, the few, the chosen few, who are in church and trying to go about as, as normal as possible, trying to present a church in the building. And they will say, this is the right thing to do. And that is their choice. And that's fine. There are many people who need that to hold on to. For me, I'm not rushing into that way of, of, of addressing this crisis. I feel that I need to be with you all, joining with you in this uncomfortable feeling. Samuel was definitely uncomfortable as more of Jesse's sons passed before him. And then realizing, well, there's no more sons. What do I do? Do you have any more sons, Jesse? He was in an uncomfortable time. And that fear probably made him feel like he was in a foreign land. Don't let the fear grip you so that you can't do anything and so that it overwhelms you. I've just thought of something. I'm going to turn to um, a prayer that we say at many funeral services. This is on page 603, if you want to make reference to it. And it's uh, the third paragraph down. We pray for ourselves who are severely tested by this death. And let's put this in terms of this time. We pray for ourselves who are severely tested by this time. That we do not try to minimize this loss or seek refuge from it in words alone. See, that's in many ways what's happening in our Christian community and also globally on the media. And also that we do not brood over it so that it overwhelms us and isolates us from others. See, it's strange because we are isolated, very much so. But we have means of communication. We have the phone, we have email, and maybe you're technologically savvy enough to set up a, a stream through either Skype or uh, many of those type of um, I, uh, you know, visual type of contacts that you can have with people. But there's nothing normal about this time. We all know this. There was nothing normal about Samuel's time. Saul was the first king. And Saul wasn't very keen on having, uh, Samuel wasn't very keen on having Saul as the first king, or any king for that matter. Uh, read 1 Samuel 7 to around chapter 13, chapter 14. This is, he's, he's not very keen at all. But God gives them what they want, and they get a king. And now here they are, and they have to get another one because God's removed his spirit from Saul. That's, that's a big deal. That's a big change for the people of Israel. This is a big change for us. And we're in the same level of anxiety. We need to understand that God, and as we say in his infinite wisdom, knows what we need and when we need it. So don't cease praying. Don't cease interceding on behalf of others and praying for those who are ill, anxious, depressed. Depression is going to go up on the rise, absolutely, at this time. So we need to bear these things together as a community, and yet even though we're not connected in the building of the church, 
We're connected in a way that we've been preaching now for easily the past 30 or 40 years. Church is not the building. Church is our heart. Just as here, the Lord says he looks on our hearts. So consider these things. Weigh these things. Don't jump into any decisions. And don't escalate or fuel the fire um, of anxiety. Um, because it will entrench depression. Uh, I know myself that there were a few days, um, Friday, Saturday in particular, that were very rough for me. I've suffered from post-traumatic stress disorder. Uh, I uh, have depression uh, and or am susceptible to depression. And so I need to take care of myself, just as many other people who suffer from these illnesses need to take care of themselves. But there are people who are alcoholics who are going to find this time very, very trying. Very trying. Because even though many have managed the illness, the fear and anxiety, um, the depression can easily lead um, to um, trying to find escapist behaviors. Be careful, be mindful. Uh, and be mindful of other people as well as yourselves if you find yourself um, with that illness. I think that my prayers are for you to continue to seek a theological reflection daily on where is God in the midst of us? What heart is he looking at today within myself? How am I turning to the Holy Spirit for comfort? How am I examining Jesus's examples of life and interaction and applying them to phone calls, emails. Think about these things very carefully and remember that um, though I am a critical of, um, uh, of the use of church during this time, um, that is my issue, and it might resonate with you, and you may disagree. But I feel very strongly that I need to be in the exile with you. And I can't sing the songs of joy in the same way that everybody else is persevering and, 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 and trying to make this normal. I, I don't feel like it's normal, and I don't want to pretend that it's normal. I respect the decisions of each of my clergy to do what they are doing um, at this time, and it is up to the bishop um, to continue to give us directives and, um, and encouragement. And I think that's ultimately the last part of my sermon this morning is we need to encourage each other. And my sole um, task at this time is to engage with you to make sure that you're well, um, to offer you the promises of God through scripture that, as Julian of Norwich says, all will be well, and all will be well, and all manner of things will be well. We'll get through this. There will be bumps. It will not be easy. There's going to be times when we're angry. And that, of course, stems from our fears. There's going to be economic consequences for each parish. And very much for ourselves as well. We're going to have to do things differently. Possibly, possibly not having a spring tea. Possibly not having uh, our gospel night. Or... Our kitchen parties, so much beloved kitchen parties, 
We don't know at this time, and we can't make any definitive answers. So instead of jumping the gun and saying, well, this is closed and that's closed and this is not happening, and you know, I need to remember what the Lord is saying to Samuel. You know, I don't see the way you see. I have a different way. I don't see as mortals see. Trust God in the midst of this crisis and be aware that he knows what's best for all of us and that we have a sure and certain hope through the res resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, you call us to react differently as individuals to the current crisis. You call us to respond in ways that know no bounds. You call us to be reflective at this time of Lent and even more so now. Help us to seek you in all things, to turn to your scripture for guidance and reflection. And let us live the lives that we're called to, to do um, in the ways of our prayer, our doxology, that we pray after each service. A glory to God, whose power working in us can do infinitely more than we can ask or imagine. Glory to God, from generation to generation, in the church and in Christ Jesus, forever and ever. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God. <laughs>